Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Kurtz. I'm head of uh, nephrology at UCLA. And uh, we give these public lectures uh, every month. And the purpose is to educate everyone about how the kidney works and then to discuss some of the diseases that affect the kidney. Uh, and in addition, uh, answer individual questions that that people might have. And, and I also want to say, if some of you uh, feel that you don't want to ask things that are too personal in front of other people, I'd be glad to uh, set up a separate meeting with you. Leslie has your emails, so and you have hers. So just email Leslie uh, if you'd like to discuss things more more privately. But the purpose of this is to have everyone have a greater knowledge about the kidney, understand what it does, and also maybe talk to your uh, friends and colleagues uh, and, and, to, and, and to educate the public uh, about what kidney disease is. So this slide here, uh, just so a cutaway uh, of uh, uh, a normal body. And what you can see here is the kidneys are here. You can't tell it, but they're sort of in the back. They're not, they're not in the front. And they each weigh about a third of a pound. So they're, they're, they're quite light. Above them is this yellow thing. That's your adrenal gland. So this, this is the gland that makes steroids. Uh, you might have heard of cortisol. Well, the, the, these make cortisol. Now, this slide's an interesting slide. This slide shows uh, on this axis here, numbers going from 60 to 100. You can think of this as percent. And... What it represents is 100% normal kidney function going down to about 60. And on the x-axis here, this horizontal axis is age going from 50 uh, to above 75. And what you see here are two lines. There's a blue line and a red line. And uh, these lines represent men and women. Um, the blue line is women and the red line is men. If I recall properly, but it doesn't matter. They're very close. But what you see, the important takeaway point of this slide is as you get older, after the age of 50, your kidney function declines. Now, this is not uh, a disease. This represents normality. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, what do we mean by kidney function? Kidney function is a complicated word only because the kidney does hundreds of things. When we use the word kidney function, or when a doctor uses the word kidney function, they're referring to one of its many functions. And one of the functions that the kidney does is it, it has a certain amount of fluid that it filters. And every day, the kidney filters about 150 liters of fluid. Now, your blood only has about five liters. So how can 150 liters be filtered by the kidney? And that's because the blood is filtered over and over and over again uh, so that the, so that this five liters of blood that we have goes through the kidneys about 30 times a day. And so we filter about 150 liters of fluid that comes into our kidneys. We know we only get rid of them as far as our urine, about a liter or two. That means we filter about 150 and we get rid of one or two. That means we're reabsorbing about 148 or 49 of those liters that are being filtered. So when the doctor says kidney function, we're referring to how many, how much fluid is being filtered through the kidneys. Now, I'll talk about it later. When you get your blood test back, you get what's called an eGFR. That means an estimated, it stands for estimated glomerular filtration rate. The word glomerular is in there because the part of the kidneys that do the filtering are called the glomeruli. There's about a million of those in each kidney. So each one filters a little bit, but the total filtration of all the couple of million that you have is about 150 liters a day. And this filtration declines with age. That's what this slide means. So if at 50, you're filtering, let's say 150 liters a day, by the age of 60, you're filtering maybe 110 liters a day. And that's not a disease. And the reason it's important is because as you get older, your eGFR, which is what comes back in your blood test, what's called your eGFR, actually gets less as you age. And that's not a disease. It's not what we call CKD, which I'll talk about in a minute. And most doctors aren't aware of this. 
So when they see that you're, let's say you're 70 or 75, and they get back a, an EGFR that's less than it should be, a lot of doctors think that's a disease and they'll discuss that with you. But in fact, that's your new norm. And everything below that then is an abnormality. So it's important uh, for people to realize that um, just because of this, you know, it's un unlike many blood tests or any, unlike the function of a number of different organs, there's a natural decline in kidney function with age. Now, why that occurs is a separate area for research. Um, the number of filters you have in each kidney declines with age, that's part of it. And there's a lot going on in the kidney pathologically or anatomically as you age. Now, some people don't have this degree of decline. This is just an, an average. You know, a minority of people stay around, you know, 90% of normal white aging. So the bottom line is if you fall on this curve and let's say you're 75, you don't have any disease. You're completely normal. Now, if you have a decline in kidney function that exceeds normality, you have what we call chronic kidney disease, or for short, you might have heard the term CKD. And for the last 25 years, it's been divided up into five different categories called CKD1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Five being the lowest kidney function or the lowest amount of filtration through, the, through their filters to one, which is minor. Uh, and this is arbitrary, obviously, because it's a continuum. It goes from one to five gradually. There's no cutoffs here. But just conceptually to think about it, doctors have created these various um, defined categories. But you should know in your mind that it, it, it's, it gradually goes from one to the other. There's no separate, separate defined, well-defined categories. If you have uh, 90% approximately of your normal kidney function, and it's inappropriate for your age. So a 50-year-old, let's say, that should be 100, if that person is 90% filtering of normal, that's CKD1. If they're filtering around 15% of normal, that's CKD5. You need to go on dialysis or get a kidney transplant when you get down to about 15% of normal. Until then, your blood tests are in general normal. You feel okay. So the, there's a big reserve. Now, this is both kidneys together, not one kidney. So if your total kidney function in both kidneys declines such as the total is down to 15% of normal, you need what we call renal replacement therapy. You need a kidney transplant or you need dialysis, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Um, so these are the stages. And the doctors will, based on your EGFR, tell you what stage of CKD you're at. Now, in many patients, you'll stay at that impaired stage for the rest of your life. And that's perfectly fine. Because as I say, you're perfectly fine until you get down to about 15. In other people, every time you go to the doctor, it'll get worse and worse. And this decline can occur at different rates. It can occur over a year. It can occur over eight years or 10 years. The rate at which you go from stage one to five varies between individuals. No one person is the same. And as I say, sometimes you get stuck at a stage. So you could actually have a decline from one to three, and then all of a sudden you get stuck at three. Perfectly fine. You have to be seen, but it's not gonna lead to dialysis. Or you might get stuck at four. In general, the worse you get, the more likely you're gonna to get to stage five eventually. What nephrologists try to do is to keep you at a given stage and prevent the decline. Now, most Americans don't even know they have kidney impairment. They don't follow it or it's not observed or they didn't get their blood test. It's a simple blood test. This isn't a urine test. It's a test called a creatinine that will talk about and from this blood test called a creatinine the lab calculates what your EGFR is or in other words from this one blood level they calculate how much fluid your kidneys are filtering which again is called the EGFR estimated glomerular filtration rate there's an e in front of it
because it's estimated it's not being measured. Now, kidney disease can be caused by multiple or results in multiple um, phenomena which are not specific, but point to something being wrong with your kidneys. If your kid, and again, usually this occurs at stage CKD four or five, you don't have these things at CKD one, two, or three usually. So you get fluid overload because the kidney gets rid of water. You're, the fluid tends to go into your feet uh, and stay there because of gravity. You also feel nauseous and you may have a lack of appetite. That's not predicted, but it's just a phenomenon that we see that people who have very severe CKD don't feel like eating and they feel nauseous. Your blood pressure goes up because you're retaining fluid and you're retaining salt. Kidney gets rid of salt, not just water. Your blood test may be abnormal. And these are called your electrolytes, sodium. These are symbols for these different things. Na is sodium, K is potassium, Ca is calcium, Mg is magnesium, P is phosphorus, HCO3 is bicarbonate. All these, the blood levels of all these things can be abnormal when you have kidney disease. You will become anemic possibly because the kidney makes a hormone called erythropoietin that tells your bones how much blood to make. So if the kidney is not making this hormone, your bones won't make enough red blood cells and you'll be anemic. You may be depressed, and that's a common feature of people either with CKD or on dialysis, and it needs to be taken seriously, and you have to get help for these people. Not everybody's depressed, but it's something that's often ignored and should be assessed in every patient with kidney disease or who's on dialysis. You can have sleep disturbances where you just find it hard to sleep at night. You sleep more often during the day. A lot of people now with kidney disease are in their 70s or 80s. And some of these things can occur just because of age, independent of the kidney. So the doctor is supposed to distinguish whether it's just a part of natural aging or whether there's it's caused by the kidney per se or a combination of both. You could have a 90-year-old who has sleep disturbances in part because they're in their 90s and in part because they they have kidney disease. So the relative percentage due to both needs to be hopefully assessed by the doctor. And also people with severe kidney disease, they don't taste the food normally. So not only are they nauseous and they don't have an appetite, but the food doesn't taste good. And that's, a, that's something that is not easy to fix, but there are things that we try as doctors. So when we're testing for kidney disease, the major thing we want to know is what's the filtration of the kidney? How many, how many liters of fluid per day is the kidney filtering? And we can get a rough assessment of that by measuring a chemical in the blood called the creatinine. So if the creatinine is one, you're filtering normal amount, roughly 125, 150 liters a day through all your, your filters. This is a picture of one filter. You have about a million of these in each kidney. You can think of it like a filter in your bathtub or a drain in your bathtub. This thing prevents the blood from getting into the rest of the kidney. And this is the rest of the kidney has these tubular like structures called nephrons. And again, there's a million of these in each kidney. When the creatinine goes from one to two, you've lost about half the filtration. When it goes from one to four, you've got about a quarter of the filtration left or a quarter of what we, the lab slip calls your EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate. Again, when this gets down to about 15% of normal, so the creatinine would go from one, let's say to six or seven, you need to start thinking of the need for dialysis or kidney transplant. Now, in addition to the blood, we also test the filter, the, those glomeruli, this, the, this part of the kidney here, by measuring protein in the urine because that filter should not let protein through. And the protein that we measure is called albumin. Albumin is what's in egg white. When you eat egg white, you're eating pure albumin. That's what the egg white is made of. But we should never see egg white or albumin in the urine. The filter doesn't let it through. But if this filter is diseased, not only does less fluid come through it, so the EGFR is low, but also there's too much protein in the urine and it'll come out in your urine. And that's what you see here. There's too much protein in this urine. We have a what we call a dipstick. We stick it in, and based on the color, we can tell roughly how much protein there is. And also, if the urine has a lot of bubbles in it, um, it's compatible with too much protein in the urine. 
The other thing that shouldn't come through the filter is blood, red blood cells. And this is obviously abnormal, but we can also have blood in the urine here, even though it looks normal. And we look under the microscope. And if we see too many red cells under the microscope, it also reflects an abnormality. Now, obviously, if we see this, the abnormality is much worse. So again, this filter not only doesn't let albumin through or egg white, it also doesn't let blood through. But if it does, it suggests there's a disease of the filter also. The other thing we look for in the urine is bacteria. There should not be bacteria in the urine. And if there, are, if there is, you have what's called a urinary tract infection. And we can see bacteria in the urine here that we should never see. And also to tell what type of bacteria we have, we can't tell from looking at it. We only get rough ideas. We actually put the bacteria on what's called an agar plate. This plate is a gel-like substance that has food for the bacteria. And it should, it should look like this. There should be nothing growing. But if you see these things or this kind of stuff, that these are colonies of bacteria growing. And from the colony, the lab can tell what type of bacteria. And also they put antibiotic, little antibiotic discs around it so they can tell which antibiotic uh, kills it. If it kills it, you see like a uh, an area here without bacteria. So if I put a disc here of, let's say, ampicillin, I would see the area around here is clear, and I'd know these bacteria are sensitive to ampicillin. So they put a bunch of different discs here, and that's how they can tell what antibiotic, tell the doctor what antibiotic the bacteria is sensitive to. Now, initially, we don't get this back. It takes about two days for this these bacteria to grow. If we see this initially, we don't want to wait two days. So we'll just recommend an antibiotic. Just statistically, we know it's likely this kind of bacteria, and it likely has this kind of sensitivity, we'll start the patient on that. If the patient tells us, you know, that the symptoms are not there, usually a urinary tract infection causes burning when you urinate or you're going a lot, um, that's suggestive you have an infection. If the patient says they feel better, we know even without getting this back, we likely pick the right antibiotic. And for confirmatory evidence, we'll wait a couple of days and the lab will say, Yes, the antibiotic is fine, just continue it. We usually treat for seven to 10 days. Now, another disease that affects the kidney, which, ac which accounts for roughly half the patients that are being dialyzed now is diabetes. Diabetes isn't just a sugar problem. Diabetes does two things. It ruins the blood vessels in the body. So this is a nice blood vessel. You could think of it like a pipe carrying water into your house. But if the inner lining gets this yellow stuff, which is fat, and also you can get blood clots. This is what's called atherosclerosis. You get this in diabetes and other things, but diabetes is a major cause of this. So you can imagine as the pipe gets narrower and narrower, you're going to have less blood flowing into your organs. If this occurs in the heart and gets very narrow, you're going to have a heart attack. This occurs in your brain, you're going to have a stroke. You want your blood vessels always to look like this. And so diabetes is one of the major reasons your blood vessels um, get ruined. The other thing that diabetes does, this is a picture of one of the filters in the kidney, cut in section. That's why it looks flat here, and it's stained with this purple dye. But this is what one of the filters looks like. Again, you have millions of these in your kidneys. This is what a diabetic filter looks like. It's all filled with this purple junk. And you can imagine how it can't filter as well. It's no different than the filter in your bathtub getting plugged up. So diabetes does two things to the kidney. And eventually, if these filters get plugged up enough or if the blood flow into the kidney gets bad enough, your filtration is going to be down to 15, 12, 10, 15% of normal. And you're going to need some sort of renal replacement therapy, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or a kidney transplant. There's many diseases of these filters. So this is another image of the filter. Again, this is what it should look like. Well, you can see this one looks like it's filled with these purple dots. These purple dots represent inflammatory cells, inflammation. They should not be in the kidney. And you, you can get inflammation of the filter also, not that the holes are plugged, but just there's so many cells and there's so much swelling that the filter just becomes useless. And you can decrease the filtration that way. This disease is called IgA nephropathy. It's an antibody actually that comes into the kidney and causes inflammation. 
this green is just showing the antibody here. It's being stained with a green fluorescent dye. And what it can lead to is a lot of blood in the urine. These patients can be fine. And then one day, you know, perfectly normal person, we can find, let's say, they get a little cold usually before this occurs, or they get symptoms of a cold. It's not clear what the virus might be. And then the next day they say, I peed and it came out bright red. The doctor needs to think of IG nephropathy. Another thing that can happen in the kidney is not a disease of the filters, is not a disease of the blood vessels, but the kidney can get stones, just like the gravel in your driveway. It looks like a stone. These are stones that came up. The stones can be in the kidney and stay there. The stones can be in this part of the kidney, or it can be in the tube coming out of the kidney. All the urine first collects here. The filters are all in here, the million filters, but they create the urine. They collect into bigger things called the pelvic kidney calyces and the pelvis, and then it goes into what's called a ureter, single tube coming out of each kidney. This goes into your bladder, and your bladder starts collecting the urine. But the stone can actually block this tube coming out. If it does, it causes this part of the kidney to start contracting like crazy. Um, this isn't a fixed pipe. It can actually contract, trying to get the stone out. That contraction can cause pain that's worse than giving birth to a baby. So people that have a kidney stone that's blocking the ureter, um, they're agonizing pain. They can fall to the floor. It takes morphine often to, to stop the pain. If the stone is under two millimeters in diameter, it can come out. And so oftentimes you'll find it in, in, the, in the toilet. You can see it. If it doesn't come out, then you need to have the stones either blasted with an ultrasound uh, wave, or sometimes the doctor has to go in with a laser and blast it. There's many ways to, to get rid of these. Sometimes the stone is left there. The problem with leaving it there often is that the stone can be can block the urine. You can get an infection up here in the kidney, uh, or you can get intermittent pain, or it can sometimes cause bleeding. About 15 million Americans have stones. There's many different types. And the, the goal is to try to determine the chemical structure and then based on that, come up with a, an appropriate therapy because the different types of stones have different approaches as far as well, how to treat people. This is another disease of the kidney. It's a genetic disease and it's called polycystic kidney disease. The gene has been known for years now and it leads to the kidneys having these huge blebs, blebs of fluid. This isn't just a collection of fluid. It also leads to, it can lead to a destruction of the tissue of the kidney where you're not filtering as much. Oftentimes you don't make this diagnosis till people are in their forties, but it is a known genetic disease. And it accounts for about five to 10% of people on dialysis currently. This is another disease, again, a disease of the filter. This is a normal filter. This is a filter in this patient. You can see again, Fill with these purple cells. This is again a ton of inflammation in the kidney, swollen. And so you can see, you don't see these nice holes, which you can think of like the drain in your bathtub where the fluid gets through. Here, it, you just don't have the filtration. And this person can end up potentially on dialysis too. Our goal, our treatment here is to get rid of the inflammation with prednisone and other drugs. This is a disease called lupus, it tends to occur in young women. And it's not just a disease of the inflammation of the filters. It also causes inflammation throughout the body. So it can involve patient's hair uh, and they lose their hair. It, it's causing inflammation in the blood vessels of the cheeks. This is not uh, from being healthy. These are actually dilated blood vessels in the cheeks. So you can see uh, the blood flow under the skin more easily. And they can get inflammation everywhere, the brain, the liver, throughout the body. Lupus, you might have heard of it. You can rarely, rarely get kidney cancer. It's not one of the common cancers. Uh, and this is just a cartoon here, but this is a real CAT scan. So this is the normal kidney here. Again, this is the back. You can tell it's the back. Is These are the bones in your spine. So this is the back. This is your front. This is where your front of your abdomen is. Your belly button would be here, let's say. So this is the back and the kidneys are sitting in the back. This is a normal kidney. It looks like a horseshoe. This is a kidney with cancer in it. You can just tell it doesn't look anything like this. Again, a, a rare cancer. 
So getting back to dialysis, these are the statistics. There's about 650,000 people in the United States on dialysis now. Every year, about 100,000 new patients come onto dialysis, and every year, about 100,000 patients pass away. So the number stays about the same. In the last couple of years, though, the numbers are falling, and that's because COVID um, caused the death of a lot of patients with what we call CKD, as I showed before. So they didn't make, even make it onto dialysis. Uh, and there's a lot of new drugs that you might have heard of, the SGLT2 inhibitors and other drugs that we have now that are preventing people from going onto dialysis more than ever before. Plus, a lot more of these patients got transplanted. So Davida and Fresini is are seeing a decline in the number of patients that they're treating, and it's causing a lot of chaos in these uh, private dialysis companies. FMC was just bought out by another company, and, and they're potentially splitting off their dialysis. Um, they're, they're, and Davida lost millions of dollars last year uh, just because of uh, their business um, declining because less people are coming on to dialysis. So this is causing in the last two years a major disruption of the uh, dialysis industry. Right. So di dialysis, hemodialysis has been around since the 1940s. It was invented in Nazi-occupied uh, uh, Netherlands um, in, a, in, a, in a small hospital. Um, and uh, basically, um, the principle is you take the blood out of the patient and you put it through what's called a dialyzer. The dialyzer takes the blood in and breaks the blood up into about a thousand um, little tubes. This whole thing is called a hollow fiber kidney. These little tubes are generically called hollow fibers, but basically the, you can think of them like straws and the blood goes through the inside of all these thousand straws, they're very, they're much narrower than a straw and then come comes through here and then they all collect at the other end and then the blood, um, it's actually going through the top here, the red is the blood in and then comes out the bottom and then goes back into the patient. And the nurses just put a color coded clamp here. So the blood coming out of the patient is red and going back is blue. Now, what does the dialyzer do? Otherwise we're just recirculating blood around and around and doing nothing. Well, the dialyzer also outside these thousand, what are called hollow fibers, puts another solution that we call the dialysate. And this is a concentrated solution that we buy typically from Baxter or Fresenius. And the dialysis unit mixes it with purified water from the city. So the city brings in the water and then it goes in, it gets purified in these huge tanks in another room called reverse osmosis tanks. And then that water is mixed with this concentrated uh, chemical solution called dialysate. And that's what's coming in here in red into the dialyzer. So outside these tubes is another solution. Now, what happens is the substances from the blood of the patient that's in the middle of the tubes goes into the outside solution. So we can remove potassium or urea or other uh, chemicals that we don't want the patient that are building up in the patient. And then it just comes out the other end. And this is not recirculated. This blue solution goes into the floor in the drain. So the dialysate comes in, leaves, and is discarded. It's only the blood of the patient that's recirculated. So the blood returning to the patient now has less urea in it, has less. It's all gone into the dialysate, which is just put into the floor. So all the patients, urea, excess potassium, all the other chemicals that, that are taken out of the blood are discarded down the drain. And the, this takes about three and a half hours and we do it three times a week. Another way to dialyze came to the fore in the 70s. It has nothing to do with blood, nothing to do with needles, but what was what was decided upon after a lot of work was that inside all of us, we have what's called a peritoneal cavity. And this cavity is like a balloon, you can think of it, but it's normally collapsed. There's no fluid in it. But it was known for years that you can fill it with fluid. You can put two or th imagine a two liter Coke bottle. You can fill it with that. And OK, so you filled it with a solution. Well, what is that going to do? Well, the cells surrounding this solution 
actually act like a dialyzer because on one side of the cells is your blood and on the other side is the solution. So you can actually take urea and potassium and phosphorus and other things from the blood and change this solution over time and then discard the solution and put in a fresh solution. And that's what is done. So you've got a little machine. Here. It takes a fresh solution, puts it into the patient's peritoneal cavity, fills it up like a balloon, and then it just lets it sit there for a couple hours. And during that two hours, it's collecting all the stuff we want to get rid of, like potassium, phosphorus, urea, whatever. And then it empties it just, and then puts in a fresh solution. And this is done four or five times throughout the night. And then in the morning, the patient just removes the tube, caps it off, and goes about their business. So the nice thing about it, it's done by the patients themselves. They don't have to go to a clinic. It's much more gentle because we're doing it every day, not three times a week for three and a half hours at a time. So it's much easier on the patient's chemistry. And uh, this is what we would recommend for any patient, not hemodialysis. Now, hemodialysis can be done at home. There's about three or 4% of the patients in the US can get a machine that um, is covered um, by Medicare and dialysis clinic gets it for them. Let's say DaVita gets it, but you need to get a technician to do it for you if you don't wanna do it yourself. There's a minority of people that actually put the needles in themselves and do this themselves. Um, but, you know, many patients in their 70s and 80s and 90s who are being dialyzed don't want to bother with that. And if they can afford it, they pay for a technician that can charge two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. They do it for three and a half hours in their home um, or in their office. There's a, some people that dialyze in the office um, and then do that three or four times a week because you have the machine. You can do it more gently, more often. So you don't have to do it. Um, you don't have to have the wide swings in your blood pressure and blood chemistries that a typical patient has who goes to a clinic who only can do it three, three times a week. If you do it at home, you can do it five times a week, and each session is a little more gentle on your system. We also recommend, and that the best thing is to have a kidney transplant if you can. We're often asked what happens to the other kidneys. Well, there's still some function in the other kidneys. So you don't have to, you know, we don't want to remove them. We never usually do. And the patient has three kidneys, one that's functioning well and two that are functioning less well. And hopefully the patient's remaining kidneys still continue to function in addition to the transplanted kidney. And when I say function, again, I'm talking about even if the filtration is 10% of normal, it's still better than not having any. And it adds to what the transplanted kidney is filtering. But in addition, the remaining kidneys may be making hormones like erythropoietin. I didn't talk about it, but the kidney also makes the active form of vitamin D. When you buy vitamin D in the pharmacy, that's not the active form. The kidney takes that pill and turns it into the active form called 125 vitamin D. That's the, that's the form that works on your bones and on your calcium and mineralization. And so if the kidney is still making the able to make the 125 vitamin D, uh, in addition to the transplanted kidney, it's better than removing that source. The future uh, will be much, much less dialysis, either because of xenotransplants, which are going to be transplants from pigs that will not get rejected, or at least will not get rejected any more than a human kidney is getting rejected. And people are working on this feverishly. At UCLA, we're working on a totally artificial kidney. Um, and uh, the future will be one of multi more choices for patients. We'll never get rid of uh, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. There will always be patients that can only be treated that way. In the hospital, we do what's called acute dialysis. So every month at UCLA, we're doing about 1,500 treatments, uh, and that is being done for patients that will not need chronic dialysis, but need it for a short period of time. That's going to always be there. Uh, and the xenotransplants in the artificial kidney will just be additional choices in the future for people who require permanently uh, what we call renal replacement therapy. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop and I'd be glad to uh, 
answer any questions anyone might have. If you can turn on your mic, turn off your, turn on your microphones. Yeah. And, uh, be glad to take any questions. And as I say, if anyone can you can you bring them here? No. I, I'm just saying if anyone has questions that they don't want to discuss in public, please reach out to Leslie, and I'd be glad be glad to get in touch with you and address those. But uh, please go ahead. Anyone who has any questions about what I said or any questions about their own health or the health of a friend. Anyone have any questions at all or anything they want to ask? Yes, Dr. Doctor. Yes, I have a question um, regarding uh, uh, the drinking of water uh, when, when you have minor kidney disease. Uh, you've spoken before about the need to drink uh, as much water as possible. I don't remember the exact quantity, but my question has to do with Instead of water, how does coffee or tea or a soft drink uh, come into play in regards to uh, the need for the water? Yes, so that's a good question. You actually have two questions. Uh, if I said you need to drink a lot of water, I misspoke because I, I never say that. Uh, okay, if, I, I misspoke. <laughs> okay. In fact, because, you know, as you're kidney function declines or as your ability to filter uh, the blood declines, um, you can drink less and less water before you're going to start retaining water. So you have to be careful. Someone who's got 15% of their filtration ability left has to drink a lot less water before they'll start retaining water, which means that your intake of water exceeds your ability to excrete it. The normal kidney can get rid of 12 liters a day. So that's six two liter. If you go, if you have normal filtration, normal kidney function, you can drink two. I wouldn't recommend it, um, but you theoretically can drink two six liter or six two liter uh, bottles of Coca Cola before you're going to start not being able to excrete it. Your kidney will get rid of the twelve liters. I mean, depends how fast you drink it, and, and don't do it because it's very dangerous. But if you drink the twelve liters slowly over let's say a couple of days, your kidney will get rid of the 12 liters. But if you are if you have CKD three or four, you might be only able to drink three or four liters before the kidney can get rid of it. So that's point one. Then the question always comes up, is drinking in general good for your kidneys and how much should you drink? And the answer is there's, there's a lot of uh, um, PR, a lot of articles, a lot of um, people talking about how good water is for your kidneys, but there's no good data uh, showing that it makes any difference at all if you drink two liters a day or four liters a day. Now, in general, it's better to drink, you know, based on your thirst, not based on what a doctor tells you to drink or based on what a friend tells you to drink. You sh your brain was given uh, the sensation of thirst and thirst occurs when the concentration of the electrolytes in your blood changes by 1%. The brain says drink because it wants to keep the concentration within a certain range. So in general, just in general, if you're not thirsty, assuming you have a normal thirst mechanism, because we have to rely on our thirst being accurate, that tells you how much to drink. And on average, you know, people drink one liter to two liters a day. So if you take a two liter bottle of Coca-Cola, you drink about half of that a day or maybe a little more than that. Now, if you're running or exercising and losing water, you've got to not, you got to take that into the math. You're losing more water than a normal person. You, you can't not replace that or you're going to get what we call dehydrated. But in general, if you drink a liter to two liters a day, you're going to keep yourself healthy, whether it affects the kidney health, whether it makes any difference to your long term kidney health. There's just no data on it, even though. You'll read every day, you know, a different story that's very confusing to the public. The water is good for you. Drink as much as you can. No data, no good data. Now, your second question is also confusing to people. Is it water or is it the type of fluid? The answer is it's not water. Water is used uh, simplistically. It's your total fluid intake, whether it's milk, water, soup, tea, doesn't matter. It's the total fluid intake. There's nothing magic about water. It's how much fluid is going into your into your blood every day. So you need to total everything up. Okay. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, thank you. 
Does anyone else have any questions? Dr. Kurtz, thanks for doing this for us. It's <coughs> fantastic access to your knowledge. Um, and the water question I had also that, so thanks for answering that. Um, I actually felt comforted listening to the uh, uh, AKI is what my I have as opposed to chronic. And, um, you know, my creatinine's uh, a little bit abnormal, GFR is a little abnormal, potassium's a little elevated, and BUN is abnormal. So I've been tracking those with my doctors. Good. And they put me on in October. Um, at the end of October, they decided to take me off of Lasix, the diuretic drug, and put me on some uh, Localma. Can and I ask you before you go on, because I uh, Leslie gave me your email. I want to address each of your questions. Sure, I'll I'll, I'll just listen. Can, can I ask you if you don't mind uh, saying how old you are? I'm 69, and I've had a lung transplant, so everything's been kind of, you know, a little bit tough after that. Thank you. And and what do they feel your CKD or your a AKI is due to? Uh, nobody said actually. They. Uh, they haven't really uh, said it. They said maybe it's the medications. Okay. Um, tonight, I thought maybe maybe it's partly the kidneys um, because I'm always anemic. And so I'm getting erythropoietin every two or three weeks. And it sounds like that's going to be the rest of my life, um, no can matter I, what I do. Can I ask you, when was the uh, decrease in the EGFR diagnosed relative to the lung transplant and getting the medications? You know, I can't honestly say... All I know is I've been on Lasix fighting edema and- uh, Was that prior to the lung transplant or after? Um, I don't recall. Okay, because Lasix is just a symptomatic treatment. It doesn't make the kidney better or worse, typically. It's just the kidney cannot filter normally, as I was alluding to, and therefore it can't get rid of your daily water and salt intake. Um, and so you try to make the salt and water excretion increased um and you know the, the response to lasix uh, gets worse as the kidney function gets worse if you're responding to lasix that's great they have to watch that uh, they have to watch that they don't overdo it because if they dehydrate you your kidney filtration will get worse because you got too much you were excreting too much sodium and water so it has to be uh watched um you mentioned aki um, so AKI is something I didn't mention. It stands for acute kidney injury. And the word acute implies that it, that it goes away. So, uh, and that going away can take days, months, or years. So the kidney can get an insult, uh, whether it's hemodynamic, which means the blood flow to the kidney is abnormal. Um, um, it can be due to drugs. It can be to the immunosuppressive anti-rejection medications you're taking. It can be due to drop in blood pressure during the operation you had. There's many reasons the kidney can get injured. And the cause of the injury then will then determine whether the kidney can come completely back to normal or whether there's some prolonged abnormality in the kidney function, in which case we don't call it AKI anymore, which implies reversibility. We call that chronic, you know, one of the five stages of chronic kidney disease. Because AKI implies reversibility. If your kidney function after an AKI insult did not recover, and you've waited enough, you know, how long you should wait, you know, varies. But let's say you waited six, seven, eight, nine months after the initial insult, and you still have um, an abnormality in the filtration or your EGFR, as I said, then that's not called AKI anymore. It's called CKD. It means, it means that it's not going to recover. And um, the reason for uh, knowing that is now the doctor approaches it differently and tries to prevent it from declining further and further and further with time. So do you know what your EGFR is? Do you know what the time course of your EGFR or creatinine is over time? It's something if you don't, you really want to follow closely. Every time you see the doctor, you say, what's my creatinine? What's my EGFR? And you should keep it if, if, if you're so inclined and in an Excel spreadsheet. Just track it because what you want to know is you already know it's not normal, but you want to know is it is is it flat? Is it getting any worse? Is it or is it staying the same? If it's staying the same, that's great. You want you don't want to see, you know, every six months or every three months, how often you see the doctor. You don't want to see that 
getting worse and worse and worse because uh, that means that uh, there's number one you don't want to see that at all anyway because you always want it higher but in, but it also means that maybe there's some treatment that you could get to prevent the decline or maybe the pills you're on are declining it and they need making making it worse they need to change the amounts you're on sometimes if these anti-rejection medications the blood levels get too high they they can affect the kidney so it means the doctors need to think when they see that um and also you know i don't know if you see a nephrologist but you should be seeing one because well, so, uh, just to clarify if that's okay uh i've spoken to dr lodi a couple of times and you were, were there at the end of those discussions and both visits were very reassuring so i'm just trying to hone in on what i should be aware of because i think i'm a stable situation with the gfrs running in the uh 61 60 67 63 63 for the last how five often, visits. How often is that being measured? Uh, usually every month or every two weeks, okay, depending on- Well, way. everything you're saying sounds great. You have stable- e Now remember the EGFR has an E in front of it. It's an estimate. It's not your true filtration. So the way it works is, uh, back, uh, unfortunately back in the eighties and nineties, we stopped measuring the, the what we call the GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate. It stands for how much fluid is coming through all your millions of glomeruli. That we used to measure, but uh, it was a radioactive measurement. It just uh, fell out of favor and people started coming up with a surrogate formula, mathematical formula based on the blood level of the creatinine to sort of guess what the EGFR might be. And it's more than a guess because they compared it to real measured GFRs. And, but it's still in a given individual can be off by 15, 20%. You're, your EGFR may be 45 or, or maybe 75. So it, you have to just know that in the back of your mind. Um, um, we are working at UCLA on a, a, a way of measuring it again directly that's not based on um, not based on radioactive measurement. Uh, I'm working with a company. Um, so we'll see if that comes about. But eventually we'll have a true GFR and the word EGFR will fall by the wayside. I'm, in the next few years, hopefully. But right now we rely on this surrogate estimated value and it doesn't even matter if it's a true value or not. You just don't wanna see it change. That's the key. You wanna, every time you get your blood measured, you wanna to be told your EGFR is 60, 65, 62, it'll fluctuate. But if it's stable, that's great. And you wanna keep it there the rest of your life. Now, um, there may be things to do with your anti-rejection meds or other meds that always has to be monitored. You know, maybe if your Lasix was decreased, your EGFR would get better. I don't know. But well, so on the 28th of October, because they kept me off it on the 26th and 27th, they discharged me without Lasix and I haven't taken a spot of Lasix, a drop of Lasix, not one milligram since then. And I'm a happy camper. And my, you know, it seems like everything's gotten better because um, you know, but I, I think I gave you guys the, uh, the 24 hour urine as well. And that didn't seem to be that upsetting or that disconcerted for you guys. Well, the 24 hour urine also, I don't remember exactly, you know, the specifics, but the 24 hour urine has to be looked at both, uh, from a knowledge of renal physiology and, and medicine. A lot of doctors misinterpret it and I won't get into the details here, but there's, we, we look at things called a steady state or non-steady state. In the steady state, the numbers can come back completely normal, but there's still something abnormal going on, and most doctors miss that. So the, it really depends on the subtleties of, of of when the measurement was done or not. And, and, and again, there's not enough time to go into that now, but um, all I'm saying is normality in the urine doesn't necessarily mean uh, that things are normal. Many times it does, many times it doesn't. And there's a lot of subtleties that one has to be aware of in assessing that. Uh, I'm not saying in you it wasn't normal, but it's just something that that we need to consider. Uh, you had some questions that I thought would be worth maybe going into. You asked about decreased appetite in three Novosaurus drinks a day. Um, usually it's two. Novosaurus is one of the two um, supplements that patients get, Nepro, um is is the other one um you know you just have to think about the content uh it's not going to hurt you as long as the, the taking those three is not affecting your blood chemistry and is not affecting your weight and 
you know, they not too many calories for you. So you're gaining weight. So again, that's between you and your doctor. But in general, on average, two are taken a day. You may be able to take three. You may be able to take four. I mean, it really depends on a number of things that you need to discuss with the doctor. You asked about the difference between Nepro uh, and Novosaurus. Novosaurus is by Nestle, Nepro is by Abbott. Yeah, there is a difference. I mean, Nepro has more sodium, more potassium, more phosphorus, um, less calcium, uh, and more protein. So it really depends on your blood chemistry. Um, you're talking not major differences, like the sodium is 250 milligrams in Nepro and like 217 or 210 um, in Novosaurus. The potassium is 250 in the Nepro versus about 190 in the Novosaurus is less. The phosphorus is a bit more in the Nepro. The only thing that's less is the, is the calcium. There's more calcium in the Novosaurus, but that may not be a bad thing. I don't know what, what the status of your bones is, mm -hmm. blood calcium or your vitamin D levels, your parathyroid hormone levels. But in general, you're talking really minutia. Uh, you're not talking about a major difference between these things. So thank you very much. Um, I wouldn't overthink that. Um, you asked about uh, AKI um, caused by anti-rejection meds. Yeah, I mean, 11, roughly 11, 12% of patients with a transplant get AKI. So it is a known cause and it's, there's many reasons for it. As I, I mentioned, it could be when the organ was put in in the ICU, there may have been less blood flow to the kidney. So they're, they're intraoperative reasons, surgical reasons. There's things that occur after you're on anti-rejection medications that that can do it. Um, there's rejection of the organ. If it's a kidney, it can cause AKI in you. It wouldn't be a direct effect, but sometimes an inflammatory milieu in the body uh, can affect uh, the kidney. So there's multiple reasons why after organ transplantation, you can get an acute injury to the kidney. Um, now, if it's a kidney transplant, about 15% of those people that got acute kidney injury need for a period of time renal replacement therapy. The injury is so severe that for two, three, four, five weeks, they may need to be dialyzed and then they recover. So again, it's always a question when you get AKI, whether you've gone on to CKD and whether it still should be called AKI. And that's just a time dependent thing. If the AKI doesn't go away, after half a year and it's an arbitrary it's an arbitrary number of months basically what we're saying is the aki hasn't gone away and we predict it's never going to go away so we don't call it aki anymore and what that's implying is there's a permanent injury to the kidney that is not going to recover the magnitude of which depends on your egfr you asked about localma versus valtessa we have two new compounds to treat a high potassium they don't work on the kidney. What they do is they bind potassium in the gut. And so um, it, the potassium comes out in your stool. And uh, they're basically the same. The localma might work a little faster. But again, usually the issues of which one you go on are not based on their efficacy, but insurance companies, what the insurance companies, whether your insurance will pay for one or the other. Um, so it's not really a medical choice. And I wouldn't, again, overthink that. Uh, you asked, with meals or anything like that, or uh, again, should those should Locelma or Voltessa be taken with a meal yeah, around the meal because they're working? You know, you can take them a little bit before to make sure they're getting down to the intestine, uh, not too much before, um, because you don't want them to pass through the intestine ahead of the food. They have to bind to the potassium in your food. That that's the idea. So you don't want to take it too much after or too much before, but around the meal, after the meal started or a little before makes the most sense. Thank you. And again, I wouldn't overthink that because everyone has different lengths of time the food takes to get to the intestine from the stomach and, and uh, how much your esophagus contracts and pushes things down. I mean, it's not, not an exact science. It's all empirical. You just have to, which means you're doing an experiment on yourself. Uh, but again, these are great pills. They've totally altered nephrology. Before, we had no way of lowering the potassium by increasing the excretion of the stool. It's the same way we treat a high phosphorus. We have 
drugs now that bind phosphorus in the diet and it comes out in your stool. But yeah, they work, they work differently, but they're, they're, they're pretty comparable. You asked about, uh, can a person live for years with low grade AKI uh, that slowly gets better with diet? Well, there it is AKI. If it's getting better by definition, it's not CKD. So your, your question implies that it's not permanent. And yes, AKI, if it's true, AKI will get better. Now it may not get completely better it, it, so that you'll be left with some CKD, which means you have some permanent loss. The degree to which it recovers varies. It could recover completely or it can recover not at all, or it can recover partially. But if it recovers completely, then it is true AKI. Um, so yeah, if it recovers completely, then you're completely back to normal and there's no effect on your longevity. If it recovers partially, then you have CKD and it depends really on the severity of the CKD. Um, if it's mild CKD, stage one or two, then it's really not going to affect your life at all. If it's CKD five, then you're potentially going to have to go on dialysis. Uh, and patients on dialysis typically don't live as long. But again, that's a complex literature too, because it, what determines your longevity with kidney disease really is not the kidney, it's your heart. You know, and I tell everybody that if you're on dialysis, so you have CKD four or five, the most important thing you can do for your body is make sure your heart's perfect, your coronary arteries, your valves, the heart muscle. And really, ideally, every patient on dialysis would be seeing a cardiologist. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, if you can, if you have chronic kidney disease and you can convince your doctors, your primary care doctor or your nephrologist to treat yourself optimally, like you look after your car, you would be seeing a cardiologist because the cardiologist may make a diagnosis that hadn't been made, but can at least make sure the, the, you know, the motor is working fine. And by the motor, I mean your coronary arteries are wide open, so your heart's getting blood, your valves are working well, opening and closing, and uh, the muscles contracting properly. If you have that, you're going to live a long, long life till 120 or longer. But the kidney <laughs> disease itself isn't what, what causes your demise. People don't, you know, per se, die of kidney disease. We have dialysis and we have we can replace the function of the kidney we cannot re replace the function of the heart easily so if you have any kidney disease or actually any disease not just kidney disease you should be exercising daily walking eat well think of everything going into your mouth don't put a thing into your mouth unless you ask yourself is this good for me definitely if you have kidney disease you have to potentially watch the pills you put in because some pills are bad for the kidney things that are prescription and not and even the ones that aren't like ibuprofen um, is not good for the kidneys if you have pain take tylenol not too much tylenol because you can get other problems with your liver and your blood chemistry but ibuprofen is not good for the kidneys there's many people that have back pain that took too much ibuprofen you know, eight, nine, 10 pills a day for months and months and months, and they destroy their kidneys, they're on dialysis, some, some famous people. Um, or Tums, Tums is another one people think is benign. A lot of women are taking Tums for their bones. You take one or two or three a day, that's fine, but not 10 a day uh, for months and months. And Tums with ibuprofen, forget it, you're going to be on dialysis in, in half a year. So there's a lot of drugs you have to watch out for. But in addition, the kidney gets rid of a lot of the drugs. So you have to modify the dose. It's not that the drug hurts the kidney, but the blood level of the kidney or the blood level of the drug can go up if, if it's excreted by the it's same story with grapefruit. You might've heard, don't take a grapefruit uh, with these drugs because the grapefruit can uh, affect how well the liver uh, metabolizes certain drugs. And so the blood level can go high. In general, the whole grapefruit story is way overplayed and scares people though. Um, but if you have severe kidney disease, it's not the liver that's being affected, but the, the drug is gotten rid of because typically it comes out in the urine to some extent. And if you, if you don't have functioning filtration in your kidneys, the blood level can go too high and the doctor has to know to cut back on the dose. 
other drugs are dialyzed off. We have to watch that. So we give a patient a drug and they're on dialysis and the dialysis is removing half the drug. That's the, con the, the, the converse problem. We have to increase the dose we give the patients. So all these things have to be you know, thought of. But in general, in general, if you exercise to the extent you can, obviously it gets harder. People who are in their 70s and 80s and 90s are, get tired more often, have muscle aches and joint pains. They may have lost their balance so they can't walk as well. But in general, just do the best you can and start early when you're younger in your 50s and 60s. Don't wait till you have a problem. Think preventatively and you know, watch your diet. Don't put junk into your body just because it tastes good. It's not worth it. Watch your weight. Don't get diabetes. The most common cause of diabetes now is not because your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. That's type 1 diabetes. It's because people get overweight and insulin, when, you get over, when, you're, when your weight is too much, stops working well. And you get diabetes and you get all the problems from diabetes in a, in a certain percentage of patients. And as I say, diabetes, and it's the type two, the obesity kind, is the most common reason for kidney disease on this planet. If you get rid of diabetes, you, re you empty out half the dialysis units. You get rid of half the kidney transplant programs. And you put nephrologists out of business, which is a good thing. <laughs> Doctor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. That's Bertha. Okay. Yes. Um, my husband uh, has his uh, creatinine is uh, 1.32. And uh, as of the last test that they did uh, in January, January um, 11, and uh, his GFR is 48. How serious is it uh, his uh, chronic kidney, his kidney disease? How old is he? 86. Okay, so again, an 86 year old has an EGFR of about 70. If you look at that. No, it's 48. No, 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 no. I'm saying a normal 80 year old. If you remember that first slide. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Okay. A normal 80 year old already has an EGFR of 70, 75. That's normal. He doesn't start at 100. That's number one. So everything below 75 is abnormal. Okay. So he hasn't lost. You don't look at him like he went from 100 to 45. He went from 70 or 75 to 45. It's not as much of a decline. That's number one. So it's not as bad as it would be if he was 50 and it went from 100 to 45. If it went from 100 to 45, he lost half his kidney function. It's like taking out one kidney. I see. If he went from 70 to 45, he lost some, but it's not, not as bad. So that's number one. Number two, we, when we see this, we have to decide, is this AKI? Is this acute kidney injury? Or is this something he's had since he was 50? And it's always been 1.32. So that's my next question. How long has he had the creatinine at 1.32? You know, actually, um, he was, um, he recently, in, on December 1st, he had open heart surgery. And uh, prior to that, his uh, creatinine was uh, 139. And on the January test, it was 132. Okay, so, so first of all, this test is not accurate to three decimal places. You're making a distinction between 139 and one. Three, two. The lab can't even distinguish 1.4 from 1.3. So you're looking at these small little numbers. There's absolutely no difference between 1.39 and 1.32. We round it off. They're both 1.3, 1 1.4. It's the same number. There's been absolutely no change in the kidney function between December and now. That's number one. But I get back to my previous question. How long has the creatinine been 1.3? What was it a year ago? What was it two years ago? If he's had- I think it's, it's been approximately three years. Then, then, then he's had stable CKD for three years and you only know about it for three years. Maybe he's had it for 10 years or 15 years. This is the problem we always have 
We never know exactly how long. The longer he's had it, the, le the less you have to worry about it. But at least, you know, for three years he's had it. There's nothing new here in the last three years. Nothing new has changed. He hasn't gotten any worse. He hasn't gotten any better. He's got stable abnormality, and that's great. So as long as you keep it at 1.3, he'll live another 100 years. Oh, that's great. Do not have to worry about it. As I okay. said. Uh, uh, another question. About, sorry, sorry, I just want to say it has to be followed. You have to be aware of it. He should be seen twice a year by someone to check his creatinine. If it's like always 1.3, 1.4, 1.25, it's all the same number. You don't have to worry about anything. What you need to worry about is his heart. Make sure he has a healthy, healthy heart. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he has his cardiologist that is um, that is uh, checking him every month, every two months now. Now, you know, he's on immunosuppressive drugs. It's sort of like Stephen's question with the lung. You know, the immunosuppressive drugs have to be watched. The blood levels, if they go too high, can affect the kidney. So that he has to be watched to make sure the drugs he's taking are at the right levels. And any other drugs, as I say, he should stay away from ibuprofen. Do not take it. Take time. Mm -hmm. um, and any other drugs that can, every drug that a doctor recommends, your first question should be, can this drug affect the kidney for the rest of his life? And that's true of anyone with CKD. When you go to the doctor, because they're not aware of it, they, they mm -hmm. say, take this drug, take this drug. You have to say, doctor, can you check if this drug affects my kidney? Every okay. time anyone with CKD has to ask that question. So okay. in general, everything you're describing means that he's had this well before December um, if the numbers you're giving me are correct, I'm assuming that it was around 1.3 for three years. If you can go back further and you see that he had it when he was 50, then it's something he's had for a long time. Now, why he has it? Well, he might have had it since zero. Some people are born with CKD, with abnormal kidney function. It stays with them their whole life. Nothing changes. So okay. you really should go back, if you're interested, to see how long it's been there. But the longer he's had it, the less you have to worry about it. But three years is already long enough not to be concerned that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. You have to make sure he doesn't get drugs that make it worse or that he does anything by taking pills. I tell everybody in general, don't take supplements, not just kidney patients. There's many supplements out there that can affect the liver and the kidneys. And definitely if you have CKD, do not take supplements from the pharmacy on your own. Only take as I say, everything that goes into your mouth, whether it's a pill or food, ask your brain the question, should I be putting this into my body? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, doctor, uh, what about uh, the um, uh, potassium? Everything in the food has potassium. How can we, how can I... Uh, well, the question is, why do you have to worry about potassium? What for the first question is, what is his blood potassium? Why are you worrying about it? At well, that, uh, that, at that EGFR and um, creatinine, unless he has something else going on in the kidney, he should be easily able to excrete his daily potassium intake from his food. On an average North American potassium intake of two or three, let's say 200 milliequivalents a day, with that kidney function, he should easily be able to excrete it and his blood potassium should be, you know, completely normal. Unless there's something else going on. Sometimes you're on a drug that prevents the kidney from getting rid of potassium, or sometimes there's something else going on in the kidney that we, that we, uh, that affects the ability of the kidney to get rid of potassium. But if it's just that creatinine at 1.3 with an EGFR in the forties and nothing else going on, his kidney should be able to handle the average North American potassium intake with ease. Okay. So why, okay very good. why are you um, the reason I was concerned because I have a, a friend that is in dialysis and he I told him that my husband has chronic kidney disease and he told oh, me but you're you concerned. have to he you're has concerned. to watch the potassium. That's totally incorrect. You're comparing apples and oranges. You have one person who has no no kidney filtration and all the potassium they eat stays in their body and we have to remove it on dialysis. Versus your husband, whose kidney has some impairment, 
but it has a great ability to get rid of the daily potassium intake that people eat in North America. There's absolutely no reason. Now, if you're now if the EGFR was 20, if you're if you have 20% of the kidney filtration left, yes, then the potassium can start going up or or 30%. But at the level your husband is at, um, he's easily able to um, to get rid of potassium. And empirically, you just measure the potassium in his blood, which I'm sure they measure every couple of months, and I'm sure it's it, normal. Yeah. So there's oh. nothing for you to think about with potassium. Do not, Wonderful. Do not think about it. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Anybody else have anything who's spoken already or other people that occurred to you that you're worried about that I can help with? Okay, well, I hope I've addressed some of your questions and alleviated some worries. And as I say, anyone who uh, thinks of anything uh, afterwards or would like to address questions privately, I'd be glad to help anyone. Uh, please teach your friends about how the kidney works. There's a lot of exceptions uh, um, and worries and try to tell everyone to get their kidney function measured because it's much better to get it measured when the kidney is still healthy and to track that throughout your life and to prevent it from having any problems then to find out after the fact and unfortunately there's 40 million americans in the united states who have some sort of egfr decline and most of them aren't even aware of it so thank you very much and uh, thank you thank you doctor thank you doctor bye-bye